The things, if you read Isaiah chapter 1, when you get home tonight for your homework, read Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 is very scary because God says to the people of Israel things like this. He says to them, I won't accept your sacrifices anymore. I don't want your bulls, I don't want your goats, I don't want your lambs, I don't want your blood sacrifices. I, the, in fact, I got to tell you, your sacrifices that I once told you to give me now make me sick. So don't do it. Oh, and by the way, I'm not going to hear your prayers anymore. First few, you don't even have to get through all of chapter one, but halfway through chapter one, you would be afraid. Because God is saying to these people, I'm no longer listening to you. And I don't care how many prayers you pray. The more you pray, the more I'm going to definitely not listen. So I won't hear you. You haven't heard me. So I'm not going to hear you. And I don't care what kind of trouble you find yourself in. Don't count on me. Now we all know that we face trouble sometimes and one of the things that encourages us is that when we are facing trouble we know that God hears us and we know that we can pray wherever we are and we know that God is listening but can you imagine if God stopped by your bedside tonight and said oh by the way I'm not listening to you anymore I tried to get your attention you didn't want my attention I'm not listening to you anymore I'm not accepting your sacrifice. I'm not accepting your prayers. We are finished. And then he goes on to tell them about the enemies that are going to come in and take them all prisoner and how nasty it's going to be. But then toward the end, he gives them a promise of hope. He tells them of a redeemer. He tells them of a Redeemer who will come, who will be lifted up, who will be marred and disfigured, who when he is seen, men won't even recognize him because of the brutality they will have taken against him. And this suffering Redeemer will die, be buried, and rise again. This is the hope he gives to them. The same hope you and I have. The story of the cross of Jesus Christ. The man who lived and died and continues to live forever. The man who died on the cross was buried in the tomb and raised on the first day of the week. That same story that you and I have been told over and over and over again. Isaiah tells that story to Judah. He holds out, God's against you, but God's going to get, he, you're not going to listen. Listen, how would you like to be a preacher when God calls Isaiah? When God, in fact, let me move on to this because I'm going to, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, this is when God is calling Isaiah. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah, of course, stands up and says, I'll go, send me. What you don't see in this verse is that God stops and says to Isaiah, I want you to know something. You're going to preach and no one's going to listen to you. I know how he feels. <laughs> I have been doing this for 40 years. For, over, for 40 years, more than 40 years now, I've been preaching the gospel. And for more than 40 years, it's as though people aren't listening to what you say. They walk right on by the cross. They turn their noses up at Jesus Christ. Isaiah was told by God, you're going to have a ministry. You must confront Israel to the north. And you must confront my people Judah here in the south. But I want you to know before you get started, this is going to be a ministry of nearly 50 years. And in 50 years, no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to listen to you. I want you to know that. But I want you to be faithful to do it anyway. See, I don't get to come and go to, well, this church is bigger and that church is bigger, therefore I'm going to go to the bigger church. You go where God tells you to go. 
And then if God says, oh, and by the way, Terry, no one's going to listen to you. Hey, that's fine with me. God said to Isaiah, you know what? Your message is going to be, in fact, he said, Israel is going to be like a tree. They're not going to listen to you. I'm going to cut them down. And out of the old root, a new tree will grow. No one will listen to you, but in the future, in the future, people will hear of this blessed Redeemer. This one who has suffered more than any man. This man who was so beaten and abused. This man who was killed all the day long. Who as a sheep stood before his shears and spoke not a word. No one's going to listen to you today. But there is going to come a time when people will hear your message. And it'll change their life. No one listened in the day of Isaiah. But I got to tell you, when I read, first read the, the gospel, or I should say the, 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 the writings of Isaiah, it literally transformed my life. I wanted to hear what he had to say. And hopefully he said, hey, you know what? At least Terry listened to me. Let's take a look now at this man, Isaiah. For 50 years, he's going to preach. Surprisingly, no one's going to listen. We have been preaching and preaching and preaching here in America. Repent America, repent America for nearly 50 years and no one's been listening. But we keep on preaching because in the future, somebody might listen. Amen. Let's consider the good of this man. He did some good. Let's look. First of all, he's considered the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. You say, but he had no effect. How could he be the greatest Old Testament prophet if he had no effect on people? He didn't have any effect on his generation. And he was not considered great in his time. He served five kings of Judah. Five kings heard him preach. None of them. Uzziah paid no attention. Jotham went his way. Ahaz. Hezekiah for a short time. Hezekiah listened. And then Hezekiah's son Manasseh came along and saws Isaiah in half. Shoves him in a hollow tree and saws him in half. The old magic trick that gets relived is really the retelling of this man's life. Considered the greatest for doing what? See, here's the thing that we have to learn. We think in order to do something for God, it has to be big. And the truth of the matter, the biggest thing that was done for God, nobody even noticed. He wrote 66 chapters in his book. He told us about Jesus. He told us he was coming. In fact, you and I, around Christmas time, we read a lot of Isaiah. You know, Isaiah, uh, look at this second point. He is the most quoted Old Testament prophet. Over 50 times in the New Testament he's quoted. You can't get through Matthew and Luke without coming across Isaiah a lot. You can't tell the Christmas story without the story of the virgin. You can't tell the Christmas story without telling about the Prince of Peace. You can't tell the Christmas story without foreshadowing the cross. Isaiah, 50 times, more than 50 times, quoted in the New Testament. For a man who wasn't listened to in his day and time, his time did come. And the wonderful thing is, people could sit there and look and say, listen, God talked about that a thousand years ago. Isaiah told us exactly how he was going to die. How he was going to be rejected. How he was going to rise again. Isaiah even told us that Jesus Christ not only would come once, but that Jesus would come again for his saints this time. Not to them, but for us. We all remember historically that Jesus came. You and I are now waiting on that second half of Isaiah where Jesus comes for us a second time. Where Isaiah, 
God told him nobody wanted to listen. But it doesn't matter if we think what we're doing is big or not. If God asks you to do something, regardless of how small, he may even warn you. I got to tell you. Remember Noah. Noah preached for four. Now, Isaiah, poor guy, preached for 50 years and nobody listened. But Noah preached for 400 years and nobody listened. God said, I'm going to destroy the world. Noah, you need to preach and tell people I'm going to send rain upon this world and I'm going to destroy it. Nobody except his own children and their wives, his three sons and their wives, all that got in the ark. That was it. 400 years. I want you to do something for me, Noah. I'm going to be with you in power and in might. And what effect did it have? Saved the same eight people it would have if he kept his mouth shut. Why did he undergo the ridicule for 400 years? The mockery he must have endured for 400. He could have done it all in silence and still accomplished the same thing. The same eight souls would have been saved. Why did he preach for 50 years? Why didn't he just keep silent? Because God said, listen, no one's going to listen to you. I'll write it down, I'll hide it away, and in 50 years, 60 years, 100 years, somebody will find it because God said someday somebody will listen to me. But why don't I be quiet now instead of preaching out loud and having people, he had to tell people that God was sending the enemy to destroy them. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that God is sending the enemy to destroy you, especially when you think you're God's favorite people. The Jews were convinced that they were God's favorite. Moses told them that. You are the favorite of God. You are God's anointed. You are God's special, peculiar people. Therefore, you have this offering and this offering and this offering. And we have this ritual and this ritual and this ritual because this is what makes us special to God. And God said, no, it makes me want to throw up when you do that now. You're not my people. You have scattered yourselves to the heathen. You're sacrificing and sinning the exact same sins that the rest of the world sins. You haven't set yourself aside for me. You haven't made yourself my people. You have made yourselves the people of this false God and that false God and that false God. You act and behave. You talk and swear and curse and behave just like the rest of the world. So I'm going to ignore you just like I'm going to ignore the rest of the world. Wow. No wonder he wasn't too popular. But he was a powerful preacher both of judgment and hope because he was able to tell them God is coming to destroy you but God isn't without mercy because God himself will provide a redeemer. And God himself is going to die for you. And he tells them the story of their destruction. But then he also tells them of their millennial kingdom. You know the thousand year reign of Christ? Isaiah tells them all about it. How that Jesus is going to rule and reign. How that David's descendant is going to rule and reign here on the earth. And all the kingdoms of the earth are going to come into Israel. And they're going to honor the Christ of Israel. And he gives them that hope as he is telling them about the destruction that's going to come. Yes, destruction in your time. But God isn't finished with us yet. God is going to find a way to redeem his people. And so here's Isaiah, powerful preacher of judgment, yet equally powerful in giving hope. He carried out, as I reminded you, this ministry, even though he saw a little response. You know, most of us, if we didn't see God do big things every day for us, we're going to quit on him. Lord, if there ain't 300 people in this church next week, I'm done. <laughs> you know how many times I would have been done? Quite a few. If God brings in 300, praise the Lord. I have preached to my thousands. I have preached to my few. And as my preacher used to say, if you can't preach to two, you can't preach to 2,000. It's the same thing. It's whether or not you're doing what God asks you to do, not what you want.
Oh, sure, in my heart, like everybody else, I'd love to preach to 10,000 people every time I got up. I'd like to have one of them there churches that are constantly saying, Preacher, that Cadillac was old last week, so we got you a new one this week, too. Yes, I'd like to. <laughs> you know, maybe I'd write me a book and become a number one bestseller. But that ain't what God asked me to do. Right now, he said, hey, I got news for you. I'm going to send you someplace and no one's going to listen to you. Wow. Uh, really? Uh, can I really go there for you? Sure you can. And I'm going to leave you there a long time and no one's going to listen. You're going to see very little. But it's going to accomplish much for me. See, and that's the thing. Maybe the little that I do now, 5, 10, 15, 20 years when my grandkids are older, maybe it'll have a difference in their ministry and in their life. And they'll say, oh, hey, remember Grandpa? Crazy old coot. Sure, I remember him. Didn't listen to him, did we? But we do now because he's old. <laughs> he preached during the reign of five kings, but changed none of them. In fact, one of them ends up sawing him in a log. But here's a trick about his life. God again, now, again, Isaiah's writing the book, so if you're writing a book about you, you're going to say anything bad? But God doesn't bother to mention anything bad about Isaiah either. The rest of the writers, the New Testament writers, no one says anything bad about him. He's, he, his life is told to us in the book of Kings. He's mentioned again in the Chronicles. He's mentioned, as I said, in the New Testament as well. Nobody ever says anything bad about him. There's no bad mentioned about him. Wow. That's not a bad thing. If I can get through life and no one has... When I'm all said and done, and there's no bad news to say about me, okay, not a bad deal. Now let's look at the lessons that we might learn from his life. Because these, I think, are important to you and to me. Now, here's a man who lived literally thousands of years ago. But he's still so relevant that we're talking about him today. We hardly preach sermons where he isn't somehow mentioned or related or quoted in the telling the story of Christ. He is that much a part. Yet, none of us ever met him. None of us would really know him. Probably some of us, maybe tonight is the first time we're even hearing about him as we do this study. But here's the thing about his life. While he was confronting sin, he was also trying to comfort people. He never got angry at the people. He got angry at the sins of the people. And he let them know that God was going to judge them for their sin. And this sin, and this sin, and this sin, and this sin is all taking you to hell. And until you let go of that sin, you will be drugged to hell. But he never once got after the sinner. Just after their sin. Now it's hard. It's hard sometimes in our lives as Christian people. When we see people sin. It's often hard for us not to be angry with the sinner. See this is God's work. It really is. And the ability to preach against sin. And yet to love the sinner. Is a remarkable thing. And we could see God in this man's life because for 50 years, as he's watching the armies come in and take Israel captive, he never once gloated. He never once said, I warned you and you didn't listen to me. Instead, when they lost, he wept for them. If only you had turned, if only you had turned, he could cry to himself. But he wasn't condemning them. He was condemning the sin that held so tenaciously to his people and the sin that his people held on so strongly to. It's like America. America is so bound to her sin, she won't let it go. 
She keeps saying it's okay. Whatever, when I was a kid, there used to be sin. Nothing is a sin anymore. Everything is just your choice. Everything now is just simply an opinion that's different from mine. There's no sin anymore. America does not see the fact that she is murdering babies by the millions a sin. It's a choice. It's a choice. Murder is a choice. I can murder. I can't murder. I choose to murder. It's okay because it's my choice. And this poor little buggered kid can't say anything about it. Now if he was 29 years old and I shackled him to a bed, they'd arrest me and take me off to jail. But so long as he has no voice, can't vote, murder them all. 15 million a year and America says it's our right. And we, we elect people who will vote for us the right to murder children. And we say to God, we're your special people. Greatest land in the whole wide world. The land of liberty. And we murder children. We have a drug epidemic. Oh, but it's not a sin. It's just some bad decision making on people's parts. They got something that they call the heroin triangle now in the south of all places. In, in rural America, they got this big old area where people are just killing themselves with this stuff. It is killing more people, heroin is killing more people nowadays than car accidents. It surpassed auto accidents. Auto accidents have always been the number one killer in America. Not today. Heroin is now killing more people than car accidents. But it's okay. There's no sin involved. It's just a choice somebody made. It's a choice different from yours. Oh, and by the way, let's help them out by legalizing because they're getting in trouble a lot for having pot, so let's go ahead and legalize that one. At least that's one less thing for them to get in trouble for. And let's give them brand new needles. Did that slow anything down? Uh uh. What went, see, here's the problem with our thinking. Back in 1970, we said there are 12 girls who have died because of abortions. So let's save 12 girls. We saved 12 girls at the cost of 15 million babies a year. Oh, we saved the 12? Sort of, kind of, maybe. But we clearly murdered the 15 a year. Since 1970 to now? 60 years? You want to add them up? It's quite a few. You think God's not keeping score? You think those children aren't talking to God in heaven? About the butchery that happened when they were cut in half? When they injected insulin into their brain to boil it? But it's a choice. And I got elected for that choice. This is our problem. Listen, these poor people are getting infections because they're using old needles. It was a problem back then. So we gave them clean new needles, all they want. So now it's an epidemic. More people are dying from heroin than they were dying from car accidents. Oh, we saved a couple of hundred. Please understand, we saved a couple of hundred people. All it cost us was several millions of them. See, we always save a few at the cost of millions. And we go to Isaiah and we say, Isaiah, yes, you may have called all these things sin and you may have thought it was wicked, but I want you to know, they're just choices. Maybe a choice you didn't make. Maybe not a choice that God would make. But see, God's been erased from the picture of America. You can't talk about him. He doesn't exist except for with a couple of you loony people. But see how smart we were? I saved 12 girls 
I saved 50 or 60 of these drug addicts from hepatitis. Oh, the fact that it cost millions a year, forget that part. We always save one or two at the cost of millions, and we don't understand it's sin. We don't understand it's sin. One result of forgiveness is wanting to share that forgiveness, and the problem is people aren't getting forgiven anymore because no one's asking for it. We're all standing up and telling God how good we are instead of asking God to forgive us our sins. We're telling God we don't sin anymore. We just make bad choices. Maybe not the choice he would have made, but it's a choice I made, and you have to learn to live with a God. See, that's what the Jews were saying to God when God said, you know what, I'm not going to talk to you people anymore. I'm done talking. I wonder if there comes a time when God says to America, I'm done talking to you. I wonder if it hasn't already happened. He said it to Israel. See, God is pure, perfect, holy, just, and loving. The day that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he never forgot that he saw God high and lifted up. And so if what I have to do is hard, and what I have to do go against everybody else, I'm okay with being against everybody else so long as I'm on God's side. So it didn't affect him that he had to do a lot and no one got, gave him any attention. Today, people all want attention. I want you to be my friend on something or other contraption that I own. Friend me. No, I don't need people to friend me. If God is my friend, I'm contented with that. If America doesn't want to give up her sin and she chooses to walk away from God, I still choose to walk with him. I say it often, if I am the last one, I still intend to be that one. If I look around and nobody else is serving the Lord, I intend to be that last. I intend to be like Isaiah someday, stand up and say, no one in my lifetime listened. But hey, all these thousands of years later, people are still listening. And maybe when I get to heaven and I'm sitting over there on my cloud, somebody will stop by and say, you know what? I heard you. I listened. And it changed my life. What would be wrong with that?